Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, a very good afternoon to you, wherever you may be. Thanks for joining us on this edition of A Reason for Hope. A uh, Reason for Hope, for those of you not familiar with the broadcast, is our daily journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. You supply the questions. The Bible supplies the answers on each and every edition of A Reason for Hope. So uh, log on in if uh, you'd like to join us on Facebook. We're available for you at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson on Facebook. Uh, you will see the screen come up with our images on it. Just click on on the lower left-hand side of the screen, we see Bible Question and Answer Program, and you can be a part of our comment corner. Always wonderful to see people logging in, letting us know they're watching the program, but even more importantly in the comment corner, that's the main flow for our questions. If you've got a question about the Bible, anywhere from Genesis to Revelation, maybe a, a contentious issue has come up uh, about uh, your faith in the Word of God, either inside or outside the church, tough questions uh, about uh, the Christian faith. We're all over those personal issues in your walk with God. Wherever you'd like to go, we'd love to go there with you. It's your questions that determine the content of each and every edition of the broadcast. If you are listening to us on uh, Reach Radio here in Greater Tucson or Life FM in Miami, KNKT in Albuquerque, we've got another way for you to get us questions. You can uh, email us a question at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Questions for hope at gmail.com and uh, we'll be happy to answer uh, questions through that particular format. If you'd like to uh, skip uh, typing a question uh, into a email format, we've got another way to get your questions to us. Uh, phone us a question, toll free wherever you are, 1-877-556-1212 and we'll be happy to um, answer those questions. You'll get into our Google uh, phone app there. Uh, they'll ask you, who do you want to leave this question for? Just say a reason for hope. When you hear the beep, uh, just uh, share your question uh, verbally and uh, through the miracle of computer technology. They print those questions up for us, and we can answer those questions in real time. They come right up on our computer screen. So if you'd like to join the broadcast through that particular avenue, one 556 one two one two. We're also available now on uh, Instagram, are we not? On, or not on, on Instagram, on, on, on YouTube. Uh, YouTube. I'm sorry. Instagram does not accommodate hour-long podcasts. That's, so we'd have to get it down true. to one minute, but that's we'll true. work on looking yeah. into that. Yeah. Uh, we'll also be looking into any other social media platforms that would be more, uh, uh, let's just say, open with speaking things that may not be popular. And of course, recognize controversy is no limit for us. But before we get into those hazardous zones, why don't we make sure God goes first? Yeah, why don't you pray for us? My dad, thank you that we have the honor to be here, and we know that all of us here, we're just sinners that are recipients of your mercy. We just want to ask for the filling of your spirit to not only edify your people, but just allow us all to enjoy you in these moments. Continue to give witness of yourself through your word, and it's just an honor to bear witness to that. So we just ask that your name would be honored and glorified through these meager efforts. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. So starting off, uh, we got some activity in the comment corner, so we'll give you guys some priority. I uh, got a question from John. Will you elaborate, please, in the four Gospels and why they're often accused of being contradictive? A very uh, good use of a uh, Ooh, vocabulary I like there. I like that. Yeah, Good the turn of a contradictions phrase. in the Gospels. Basically, when people say that the Gospels contradict one another, they're making one of three mistakes, which are all essentially the same mistake. They don't know what a contradiction is. When we're talking about a difference in detail, that's not a contradiction. When we're talking about a uh, basically an addition, not an additional of detail and a difference, but perhaps including information that the other doesn't, that's not a contradiction. And and of course, if they misrepresent the text and say something that it doesn't, that of course is not a contradiction. I'll give you some examples. Well, let me give uh, a great example that is usually brought up when uh, people say the gospel accounts themselves can't get the story straight. And, and it'll illustrate uh, the point that you just made, Sean, about understanding what a contradiction is. And sometimes the fallacies uh, in thinking and analysis that lead people to conclude that there's a contradiction. One of the most famous ones, uh, the account of Jesus uh, dealing with a demon-possessed man 
uh, in the area of the Gadarenes. In the book of Luke chapter 8 and verse 26, we are told they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out of the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons a long time and wore no clothes, neither did he live in a house but in the tombs. Well, all well and good. But then you go over to Matthew chapter 8, as they often do, and see the parallel account of this, and you discover something. It says, when he had come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, which is another name for the same region, it's not really even a contradiction at all, uh, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass their way. Now, if you ever go online to atheistsrus.com or, uh, you know, the Bible debunked or things like this, they will always point out that Luke uh, indicates there's one demon-possessed man. Matthew indicates there are two. Hopeless contradiction, they say. Hopeless. Well, well here's, here's the problem. Uh, the account in Luke doesn't say there was only one and only one. It merely highlights the one who was doing the speaking in this particular set of circumstances. Uh, To say that there's a contradiction, you would have to have Luke saying, uh, when they came to the area of the gatherings opposite Galilee, when he came into the land, there met him a certain man from the city, and only one certain man from the city said to him. Now, that would be a problem, but all you have is the fact that of these two demon-possessed individuals, one was doing the talking, so he's the point of emphasis in all of this. This is an example of an addition of detail. If all we had was the account in the book of Luke, chapter 8, we would just assume that there was one demon-possessed man. Matthew adds the additional detail that there are two demon-possessed men that are encountered here. This is not a contradiction, it's an addition of detail. Another famous one that always comes up is the death of of Judas Iscariot. In the book of Matthew, we are told that he went out and hung himself. In the book of Acts, uh, Peter says that he fell headlong and his entrails gushed out. They'll say, oh, hopeless contradiction. I know we're getting a little bit beyond the Gospels there, but Luke and, and uh, acts kind of uh, flow into one uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, entity there. So I think that it's fair to say uh, that that's when they bring up, well, what do you do with that? You know, did uh, Judas hang himself or was he disemboweled? How did he die? Did he jump off the cliff? Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, you know I guess to use an illustration, if we were to have CSI Jerusalem, right? Uh, there's like CSI about everything. I think there's CSI Lompoc, CSI Ajo. You know, they've got a CSI everywhere on TV these days. But say we got CSI Jerusalem. In the aftermath of Judas' death, they bring in the medical examiner to determine the cause of Judas Iscariot's death. Well, here you have Judas laid out in a, an examining table. And uh, the coroner would look at uh, the fact that there were rope burns around Judas's neck and that his neck was broken, and they'd say, well, clearly this man, the cause of death was that he hung himself. Well, you'd say, but wait a minute. Uh, Here his abdomen's ripped open and his entrails are hanging out. You've uh, given me a hopeless contradiction here. Uh, You you can't get your story straight. Well, no, the medical examiner would say, well, a a valid theory of what has happened here would be that uh, this man hung himself, He went out and hung himself in a moment of emotional hysteria. He didn't really think through the methodology of his suicide, probably went to the first available tree he could find, uh, probably a tree uh, hanging over some of the sharp jutting rocks that are around Jerusalem. And either he hung himself, the rope broke, or after a time the branch would break, uh, or even the body decomposing would tend to fall. And falling down on these sharp, jutting rocks, the abdomen would be ripped open by the fall. Now, if the CSI Jerusalem analysis analyst said that to us, would we say, oh, that's a hopeless contradiction? Or would we congratulate him for the thoroughness of his report? Well, that's all the Bible gives us in the case of Judas Iscariot. It tells us how he met his end, that he met his death by hanging, but that involved with the hanging... Uh, was a series of events that caused his entrails to gush out. 
So. And, and note what you're doing when the atheist will then counter and say, well, you're just reading all of that into the text. It doesn't say an autopsy report, and it doesn't record, say, those rope burns. It's either one or the other, isn't it? Well, no. When you're looking at two different details, you can do one of two things. You can either divide them or you can reconcile them, just like with two people in any sort of conflict. So if you're asking the question, okay, there's two different details here. Do the details exclude each other? based on what they say or what you want them to say. Because if they're two different things, the person who wants them to be separate will see that. The person who wants them to say the same basic detail that Judas killed himself is going to reconcile those passages. But note, it's more on the reasonable side to reconcile passages than divide them, because if you divide information that could be true, you're wrong. If you divide information that could be false, you could still be wrong. If, on the other hand, I reconcile information that could be right, I'm right. Yep. If I reconcile information that could be wrong, I will find out exactly where and when. So what's the more reasonable? And, and here's where I think you get down to, as they say, the heart of the matter in all of this. Uh, if you present a scenario to an individual that takes both of these things and provides a completely reasonable explanation for why you have these additions of detail rather than a contradiction, say uh, you've got one of the demonized individuals in Gadara doing the speaking, the other one not mentioned, the addition of detail in Luke. Say you've got the detail about uh, Judas going out hanging himself, the other details added uh, about his disemboweling. To be able to say to that person, and, and this is really where the rubber meets the road, wouldn't you have to concede that that is a possible explanation? And if they go, no, then you go, well, well, now why? the animus is on them. Well, then you'd say, well, why not? Why couldn't that be the case as we've laid it out? And, you know, oftentimes what you find in those circumstances is that it's a question not of the mind. It's a question of the will. It's not an individual can't believe the accounts in the Bible. It's that they won't believe the accounts in the Bible. You know, I've, I've shared this in a number of times, but it's a really good tool to have in your evangelism toolbox because especially this time of year these conversations go on and you know we're going to be getting together with the in-laws and the outlaws over christmas and and so on uh you know these things can come up and you know one of the things that i found is really helpful as far as a diagnostic and maybe even something that will get a person who's on the outside in looking at the love of god to start to think is to ask him this question if i were to answer that objection of yours to your satisfaction would you consider giving your life to Jesus Christ? You know, more often than not, they'll go, well, no. Well, then you can say, well, then clearly the issue here isn't that you don't have enough information to believe. It's not that you can't believe. It's that you won't believe. You've already made your mind up. Is that a very reasonable way of approaching uh, a crucial spiritual issue? Like, who is Jesus Christ? And this is the other thing. You know, oftentimes these, well, what about this and what about that? And, you know, kind of shotgunning that you get in these uh, alleged contradiction uh, conversations. One of the best things that I found is just pick one out of the air. Don't, uh, it's called elephant hurling uh, as far as a technique in debate. It's a dishonest technique, but it's like, what about this? What about this? What about this? Just pick one and say, uh, okay, uh, would you like to have an answer to that particular question? And oftentimes they'll, they'll pretty much say no, and they'll, they'll, they'll put their cards on the table and they'll go off on some kind of emotional rant. Well, there's an old saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. That's very, very true. And if you can diagnose that and get to the point of saying, you know, you, you, you're having this kind of emotional uh, meltdown over Christian things, over the Bible, um, why is it that when we talk about God, it seems to rile you up so much. Has there been somebody in your life who uh, identified as a Christian that has kind of done you harm? Boy, I, you know, I've, I've told this story before, but uh, my freshman year in college, I was getting ready uh, for track season to start, and I went skiing with some friends and uh, caught my tip on the last uh, run down the hill and blew out my knee. Uh, I wanted to come back and run the next year. So, you know, after uh, the therapy on my knee, I had a torn uh, ligament. Uh, they isolated it. And then I had to get back in shape. Uh, you know, I was uh, inflicted with the only uh, uh, legalized form of torture allowed in the United States that I know of. It's called physical therapy. 
And my physical therapist was a guy named Ken. And uh, every time I'd get together with Ken, I, you know, the subject of, of sharing the Lord came up because we were spending a lot of time together. And he'd just get riled, just riled about the things of God. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, the conversation one day, you know, he was kind of going to this rant about, you Christians, you believe this and evolution and all this other stuff. And, and, and I think the Lord really gave me some wisdom. I just said, Ken... Uh, every time we talk about spiritual things, you really get upset. What What's going on? Do you, you know, has there been someone in your life that was spiritual or represented Christianity that did you wrong? And he looked at me like he'd seen a ghost. And he said, well, you have to realize I was raised in a very religious home. Uh, and I went, well, you know, that that's kind of too bad, I guess. And he said, no, no, really religious. I mean, my mom insisted that we go to church every Sunday. And I thought, ooh, boy, that's that's pretty, you know. But, but then he went on and he said, I hated going to church. So what I started doing was I'd wake up at five in the morning. I'd sneak out my window and run away for the morning and, and then come back after the family got back from church and, and have lunch. And my mom decided to put a stop to that. And I kind of went, oh, well, how did she do that? And he looked at me and he almost started shaking. He goes, she would tie me up in bed every Saturday night so I couldn't sneak out and get out of church. And he just said, if that's what your God's all about, I don't want to have anything to do with him. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Ken, if, if that's what God was all about, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. But he's not like that. That's religion. That's not a relationship. Well, I'd like to be able to say that I led the guy to the Lord, but at least we got down to what the real issue was. The, the real issue wasn't the reliability of the Bible. The real issue wasn't creation versus evolution. The real issue was a well-intentioned but abusive parent that was... Uh, abusing uh, this guy in the name of God. Uh, I, I think you're going to find where there's smoke, there's fire. You know, whenever uh, an individual is really, you know, just adamant uh, about these things, like the atheists, you know, spend all their day online trying to debunk Christianity. It just reminds me of the famous line from Shakespeare, methinks the lady doth protest too much. Uh, you know, why are you so obsessed yeah, that's how the debate with John Loftus started when they were discussing the resurrection. He says, for atheists who are convinced that their existence ends in just a few short decades, to spend those decades unwaveringly focused on Christianity and the Bible, you can only wonder why they're so generous with the little time they have. Yeah. And yeah. he then pointed out, the debater that was uh, interviewing him said, uh, you might think there's something spiritual going on here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, remember something, when these questions come out, and great question, John, on about contradictions in the Bible. Uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of great resources you can get uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, a, a great one is When Critics Ask uh, by Norman Geisler. Great volume to be able to have, uh, especially if you find yourself stumped and you, you defer and you just say, you know, I'll look into that for you. You know, don't do the song and dance or say, well, if you weren't such a heathen, you wouldn't ask that question. You know, just say, hey, you know, if you don't know the answer, uh, either tell them to get in touch with us. We'll be happy to entertain those things. But get a hold of that book, uh, When Critics Ask, uh, by uh, Norman Geisler. It's about that thick, and it goes through the entire Bible with the most often asked objections uh, to uh, the reliability of the Word of God. And boy, if you got uh, that resource handy, you can, in, in honesty, say, I'm going to look into this and uh, and then I'm going to get back to you. You can use us as a resource as well. Uh, you can tell them to use us as a resource, but if they'll never watch this uh, podcast and so on, uh, you know, at the very least, you'll be able to have that uh, under under your uh, your umbrella. Um, and maybe if a book this big is a little intimidating for you, look, type in on a basic search engine, 101 cleared up contradictions in the Bible by J. Smith. Dr. J. Smith, in his debate with Shabir Ali, who's a very remarkable and well-read Muslim apologist, goes through the New Testament and points out, basically copies and pastes, but goes through the New Testament and the Old and points out some of the more common ones. Yeah. And they clear them up, not only from a biblical, but also from a Quranic perspective, if your ministry is to Muslims, how their own standards wouldn't allow this. Yeah. And if you want an even, even shorter one, I put together a top 30 objections uh, to Christianity list for my junior hires. And if you just message us here on Calvary Christian Fellowship, I'll happily forward that to you as well. Yeah, and the other thing that you may want to have access to uh, in your uh, travels through the interwebs, uh, gotquestions.org is a 
great, great website, very easy to navigate, and very solid answers to the more often asked questions that people can bring up along that line. So just to recap and going back to the first point, when they say contradiction, that's generally not the issue, but understand that what they mean by contradiction isn't a contradiction. In math format, a contradiction is when something says A and non-A at the same time, it violates the first law of logic. It cannot both be true and not true in the same way and in the same sense. Well, when they say contradiction, what they mean is an addition of detail, so it could mean it if you're willing to reconcile. It could be a misrepresentation of the text. Say, for example, they would put Luke 9 9 as a contradiction where John, uh, Herod uh, says, John the Baptist I have beheaded, but who is he who uh, speaks of these great things? Well, they say that's a contradiction because in the other gospel, sa uh, Herod says that, oh, John the Baptist uh, has risen from the dead. So I guess he thought that John the Baptist had risen from the dead in all other gospels, but Luke. Well, no, it's simply pointing out, I killed John the Baptist, so what's this guy doing preaching just like him? That's the point. Yeah. They're misrepresenting the text. Yeah. Or just ignoring context and saying, oh, well, it says here in John that the Samaritans received Jesus in chapter 4. But then in Luke, it says the Samaritans did not receive Jesus because his nose was set to Jerusalem. Well, here's the thing. At two different times and at two different, well, in the same place, but at two different times, could uh, people's opinions change? Yeah. That is possible. Yeah. So yeah. note and don't get intimidated. Be willing to do some research and know that uh, while we are willing to invest the thought into these things, the <laughs> very limited amount of thought is being presented when making the accusation. So thank you for the opportunity, John, but don't be intimidated by those things. Uh, real quick, we got yeah. a question from Mike yeah, who wants to know about the Nephilim. Yeah. Now, we spent about 25 minutes yesterday. Yeah, let me give you the Cliff Notes version. Well, well, and just, just to note this, we don't mind repeating questions. If you're like, oh, they've probably asked this before, don't get intimidated. The reason why we're going to just kind of gloss over this is because it was literally yesterday. Yeah. So yeah. that's and, why. And so if you go to calvarychristianfellowship.com, you can go to you'll see the various videos that we have up there and on yesterday's video uh, th we answer that question uh, pretty specifically Mike so uh, you can get as much detail on that as you want yeah the Nephilim uh, are all over the place you even hear about them on the Discovery Channel and History Channel and things like this uh, who were the Nephilim well in a nutshell their individuals are described in the book of Genesis chapter 6 uh, we are told that uh, when it came to pass that men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Uh, we are told there were giants on the earth in those days, <clears throat> and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were mighty men who were of old men of renown. Now, giants, what's that word in the original? The, the word is Nephilim. It literally means fallen ones. So we're not uh, talking 40-foot-tall so people. We're talking about a description of their relationship. Yeah, They're yeah. fallen. Yeah, and it, very, and it can also carry the idea, believe it or not, in the language of someone who is l very immense. And we see that term being used in the book of uh, Numbers chapter 22 to describe uh, these individuals, literally giants. We were like grasshoppers in their sight. And Say so on. King Og mm -hmm. from uh, Sihon and the other side of the Jordan River, a man who was probably... Whose bed was 12 feet long. Yeah, yeah. and he yeah. was a very large individual. Yeah. Now, that's not beyond the realm of human possibility. We're not talking about, you know, super fee-fi-fo-fum guys. We're just talking Shaq before the Lakers, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I had a chance to uh, see uh, Shaquille O'Neal up close and personal when he played... Uh, against uh, the University of Arizona when he was at LSU. And, man, uh, he looked like a Nephilim to me. He was a big but, boy. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the bottom line is this, Mike. Uh, you know, there are two schools of thought as to who these Nephilim are. The sons of God and the daughters of men are really the key issue here. Some people believe that the sons of God are angels. They'll point to Job chapter 1 and verse 6 and say that angels are referred to as sons of God there. But in the Job passage, uh, we are also told that Satan also came in among them. In other words, he wasn't lumped into this group of sons of God. Sons of God, just like in our relationship with God, it refers to having a right relationship with him.
Uh, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the sons of God, we are told in uh, 1 John 4. Uh, you know, and, and so uh, really important for us to be able to understand that. Uh, we are also told in the book of Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus was debating with the Sadducees who denied the resurrection, that those who enter into uh, eternal life are neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels. In other words, angels don't procreate. There's no need to make more angels because angels don't die and so forth. So uh, angels have no procreative abilities. They don't enter into marriage. When we go to heaven, we won't have to have marriage in order to have children any, anymore because we'll have eternal life. There's going to be no more death or need to replace people, keep the species going. So who are the Nephilim? Well, the Nephilim seem to be the offspring of individuals, the sons of God and the daughters of men. Immediately prior to this, in Genesis chapters 4 and 5, we see two genealogies, two very different genealogies. We see the genealogy of the descendants of Cain. Uh, he was a bad apple, and boy, the uh, fruit didn't fall very far from the trees. The highlight of the chapter is a guy named Lamech who composed a song to his two wives. He was already into polygamy, uh, saying that uh, if uh, some teenager smarts off to him, he's going to kill him. And if anybody comes after him, if uh, Cain was going to be avenged sevenfold, then uh, Lamech will be avenged seventyfold. Uh, and, and, you know, just this horrible kind of brutal picture of the, the life of the flesh. Interestingly, in Genesis 5, we're given a picture of the descendants of Seth that uh, was given to Adam as a replacement for his godly son Abel, and almost uh, without exception. We see from the names and their behavior uh, that these were godly individuals. The highlight person as opposed to Lamech in Genesis chapter 5 is uh, Enoch. Uh, Enoch, the guy who walked with God and was not, for God took him. So, you know, here you see the sons of God and the daughters of men getting together. Uh, the, the real issue here isn't so much the fact that there were these uh, genetically uh, impressive individuals, uh, that uh, really the, the idea of fallen ones there tells you about just how brutal they were. And it, and it dovetails nicely with why God judged the earth. He didn't judge the earth because there were angel-human hybrids and he was worried about the race getting contaminated. Because otherwise he failed since they were still in Canaan at the time of Joshua and Moses. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the bottom line is this. They, uh, the, the individuals, uh, the, the reason that God intervenes and judges at this particular time, pretty clear, says that the thoughts and intents of man's heart was only evil continually. That's the reason why God moved in judgment. It wasn't because of genetics. It was because of what was going on in the heart. So, you know, there are people who will say, well, didn't angels leave their former estate and go after strange flesh like Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, that's a pretty interesting take on an obscure kind of a passage in the book of Jude that can be interpreted both ways. Uh, in other words, it wasn't uh, sexual sin that caused these angels to leave their former estate. It was it the makes fact a distinction between Sodom and Gomorrah's sexual immorality and the angels' just outright rebellion. But both are spoken in the context of God will judge evil people. Just don't be one of yeah, them. Yeah, he judged evil angels. He judged evil people at Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to judge these false teachers. That's what Jude is all about. So, Mike, long and the short of it is this. Uh, the Nephilim that we find there, uh, I do not believe, are angel-human hybrids. Uh, I've read some speculative stuff that says that uh, because a man was technologically advancing so rapidly at that time, remember, they were very close to the fall. They had uh, a lot greater mental capacity than we do, that maybe they were messing around with uh, the human genome, and maybe they were trying to make man again in their own image and likeness. We don't know. That's all speculation. But the, the long and the short of it is this. To build a doctrine that says that uh, the Nephilim were human-angel hybrids and the flood came because that would make man unsavable. That's usually the way it's, it's presented. As you mentioned, Sean, uh, that all falls apart because in Numbers chapter 22, when the scouts come back from looking over the land, uh, the majority report was, yeah, it's a land flowing with milk and honey and, and everything he says is true, but there are these walled cities there and we saw the Nephilim there and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. 
You know, the so, average Jew living not only in Semitic bloodlines, but also in Egyptian culture didn't extend beyond around 5'5 five, five at most. Yeah. Now, if we're going to compare that to, say, Germanic boy here, 6'3", let alone 7 or 8 foot tall Canaanites, yeah, we're I, talking about a scary comparison. Goliath. Uh, being nine foot six inches tall. And by the so, way, that's not beyond the realm of possibility either. There's a guy who was born in China with basically a failed pituitary gland. He kept growing until his death in his mid-20s, and he grew to be almost 12. He wow. was very lanky, but notice that. Yeah. Well, you know, again, here we see that there are people that build all these doctrines, and it's all these this hoo-ha and that uh, uh, just really bad movie. It was just not even a good movie. Noah... Uh, which was kind of a Gnostic retelling of the flood uh, that uh, made the Nephilim into rock creatures and things like this. And we'll get know, into why it, it's they just, it committed just, suicide, and that was the good thing. It was yeah. just really stupid all the way around. So you know, I guess Mike, uh, the thing is, you know, you can look into these things. It's good to have a take on these things, uh, but uh, to become fixated on these things that are side issues, really. Um, you know, again, details, but the main issue was that the thoughts and intents of man's heart was only evil continually, and to miss the fact that the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said that the time of his return would be like the days of Noah, not just people eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until Noah entered the ark, the flood came and took them all the way, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. But I believe the spiritual temperature is going to be very, very similar to the times of Noah, where the thoughts and intents of people's hearts only evil continually. So I think that's, that's the bigger issue that's involved there. So, you know, again, I believe that uh, the uh, sons of God and the daughters of men was a warning against being unequally yoked, that is, getting involved in relationships that don't share your love for God. Because of that, the knowledge of the true and living God was threatening to be removed from the earth and uh and again it was a shot over the bow to the people of israel because we find later on in the book of numbers uh when this fellow named balaam came on the scene uh he couldn't curse israel he wanted to do that in order to receive a reward from the king of moab so he came up with an alternative he sent these pagan women into the Israeli camp and said, yeah, if, uh, you know, they started to worship idols and had turned from God because of these relationships. So, so in the historical context in which Genesis was written, there's an appropriate application. In the extended literary context where Nephilim also appears, it fits. In the extended, extended into the New Testament, the Nephilim fits with doctrines, understanding that angels don't marry nor are given in marriage, and making Jude obscure is a lot better than making it bizarre. Yeah, and... And, you know, the the funny thing is there there are really good people who would take different sides in all of this. And uh, whenever I go over to Calvary, Tucson, uh, inevitably Robert Furrow always tells somebody to ask me about the Nephilim because he and I disagree on this particular point. <laughs> all right, got a question from John, the other John, wants to know on the same line, who is the writer and author of the Bible in regards to the first question in the broadcast? Is there valid evidence for God being the author? And if so, what is that evidence? Well, John, there's basically two rules we need to come to an agreement about if we're going to actually say this is good evidence because remember anyone that you're talking to can say well that's not good enough you have to be willing to set some ground rules and say is if I can present you this much evidence would that be enough and again most atheists that you're going to meet are going to set their skeptometer as David Wood puts it all the way to 10 whenever you tell them anything about God but then when it comes to evolution and uh, you know cultural Marxism and all these other different things they'll They'll set their skeptometer to negative one and just say, oh, well, um, the teacher says it, so it must be true, right? Yeah. Well, if we're going to basically fluctuate in the lines between total gullibility and no proof's going to be good enough, you have to be willing to set some ground rules. Now, I'll present what I've taken the time to research in noting the historical validity of these authors in that they were done, written by human people who lived at the times of which they were reporting and get their facts straight. Then I'll hand this off to you in noting the future tense where it makes some uh, predictions that it shouldn't have been able to at the time and settings that it was put in. And if it gets the past straight, it's historically reliable. If it gets the future straight, it's prophetic. It's speaking beyond time and space. And if it gets the past and the future right, it can be trusted in the present. 
That's our rule. All yeah. right. So starting with the Bible as a whole, who are the human authors? Well, before I get into that, note that Second Peter chapter one and verse twenty says, "Know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. There is a wrong way to read the Bible. For prophecy, speaking for God." never came by the will of man, but men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So notice, the focus, the author, according to Scripture itself, is the Holy Spirit, God himself. You can look to Job and noting where he's noted as the giver of life, Genesis 1-1, where he's noted, or 1-3, where he's noted as the creator, and other ways in which we would identify the Spirit of God as God. But the Spirit moved through men. Now, who were these men, and what were their qualifications? Well, they, were, well, they weren't koalas. They were qualified. They first and foremost were eyewitnesses to everything that they reported. In the first five books of the Bible, the author was known as Moses. Moses wrote down these things going from Exodus chapter 2 and verse 11, I believe, all the way to almost the last verse of Deuteronomy in everything that he saw firsthand. Some believe he wrote his own eulogy. Others say Joshua wrote the last verses because it's kind of hard to write when you're dead. I, I, I can try it sometime, but I won't have a pulse, so you'll have to you know deal with rigor mortis like I, I won't reference the movie anyway so Moses was the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible but note he wasn't an eyewitness to Genesis that goes 2,000 plus years before his time so how did he get that information well in Exodus we also read in chapter 24 that he went up to the holy mountain with God and spent 40 days there with him to receive Genesis, Exodus, at least all the information he couldn't report on his own, and the law, Leviticus. This wasn't something Moses came up with. Numbers was eyewitness history in the 40 years of wilderness as it took place, and Deuteronomy is the collection of the last three to five sermons of Moses' life. Now, from there, we go to Joshua, which was written by Joshua, Joshua, the son of Nun, who wrote these things as he saw them take place in the conquests of Canaan. And notice that the records are rather brief. Most of the book is actually dedicated to setting borders. So noting that as well. When we get to Judges, we're discussing about 400 years of history. So note that there are more than uh, just one author for that book. But many believe, and uh, Jewish tradition would affirm this as well, that this was recapped by the head of the school of the prophets known as Samuel after the final judge had taken power and the records were available to be verified by him. Samuel obviously wrote most of 1 Samuel, but since he dies before the book's finished, we make the assumption that he didn't continue. That was taken up by Nathan the prophet, who is also mentioned by name through 2 Samuel, right. and then the final final author of 2 Samuel was written by Gad. Now, Gad, not the patriarch of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but a man named Gad in right. Israel. Uh, the first and second Kings books, uh, many believe, were written by Jeremiah, recapping Jewish history, but also note that because Elijah and Elisha, named specifically, were heads of the school of the prophets, and as well many other of the minor prophets were alive and kicking during the time of First and Second Kings. They could have been taking part in these records as well. They also wrote their books during these times, uh, Isaiah all the way through Malachi, uh, well, I guess all, Isaiah all the way through Ze Zephaniah. But when we then get to Jeremiah, Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah as well as Lamentations, and this was during the time of the Babylonian exile. He wrote this from first-hand eyewitness witness testimony as well. When we get into Ezekiel, same deal, and going in through the Minor Prophets, the dates are set based off of the information you have in First and Second Kings, not based on a number, a date, but based on the reign of King so-and-so. And the ones that we don't know, they don't tell us because they aren't lying. They simply say, this is what he said. And you have to test the individual. Right. Now, going into the New Testament, Matthew is written by Levi, the tax collector, whose Roman name was Matthew. Luke was written by Luke, and yep. as well, he was the author of Acts. Mark was written by John Mark, who is a disciple of the Apostle Peter. It's also why Mark does not include a Christmas story, but it does include Jesus' baptism, because Peter saw that part, but not the birth part. Right. It only reports what Peter saw, because that's who he was getting this information from, an eyewitness. John obviously wrote John, and as well, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in Revelation. And then the rest of the books as follows, from Romans all the way to Philemon. Some would argue Hebrews, but we can't know for sure, so we won't say for sure. But uh, all of those were written by Paul. 
and you can note that by reading the first verse. Also note that for the rest of the books as well. Now, with all of these men having been eyewitnesses to at least the time frame that they gave, what other information did they give us that wasn't just limited to their times, that they were qualified to report in the past, but did they kind of step beyond that? Yeah, you know, whenever I'm asked the question, why do you believe the Bible's God's word? Well, I think we need to have a really solid answer for that, maybe even as simple and direct one as possible. When I'm asked that question, I say there's three reasons why I believe the Bible is the word of God. Number one, it's doctrinally consistent. And Sean, you've done a great job of uh, laying out a walk through the Bible as far as the authors go and, and the consistency that's involved there. Even though it was written by over 40 different authors over a 1500 year period of time on three different continents in three different languages, it agrees down to the crossing the T's and the dotting of the I's, the most controversial subjects known to man. The second reason we believe the Bible is the word of God is that you can dig it in a sense. Uh, archaeological and historical discoveries have never contradicted but only confirmed the narrative that we find within the Bible. Jesus himself laid it out in John chapter 3 and verse 12. If I tell you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? And so that's why the Bible devotes such time to history, because it's his story, if you will. It's the account of how God worked among regular human beings to bring Messiah into the world. But the real kicker uh, is this. Uh, the, why do we consider this to be God's word? You know, you can have a consistent book, you can have a historically accurate book. Doesn't mean God wrote it. But here's the kicker, uh, predictive prophecy, as you mentioned. That's the supernatural dimension of the Bible. Uh, you know, we could you know, we can talk about specifics, and I'll give you a great specific here in just a moment. But um, there are over 103 Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his first coming. Dr. Peter Stoner in his book Science Speaks, Dr. Stoner is a statistician and uh, he sat down and did an analysis of the odds of one man fulfilling even eight of the major messianic prophecies. The odds were one in 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros after it. Uh, we don't have a name to describe a number that large. Uh, for someone to fulfill eight, just eight of these major messianic prophecies, uh, it would be the rough equivalent of taking a mass of silver dollars large enough to cover the entire state of Texas three feet deep, marking one of the silver dollars with an X and giving you the opportunity to go anywhere you want in the state of Texas covered three feet deep in silver dollars and reach down and pick out that one marked with an X. If you did that, you can have the, the whole mass of them. Could you imagine wading through that uh, three feet deep thing of silver dollars, maybe getting to Midland, Odessa, and blindfolded, you just decide, yeah, this seems like it, and you reach down about three quarters of the way down to the ground, grab one silver dollar, and boom, there's the one with the X. Uh, you know, we'd say the game was rigged. Well, God rigged the game as far as Jesus fulfilling these prophecies are concerned. When we add to this, when we make uh, the amount of uh, major messianic prophecies 34 instead of just eight, uh, the number goes up exponentially in uh, one to 10 to the 250th power. Uh, there are, there are uh, that's about the same amount of uh, number of electrons in the entire universe. Well, mark one of the electrons with an X and take your pick anywhere you like in the Andromeda galaxy, wherever you want to go. Uh, you know, again, you just see this overwhelming uh, proof that God has spoken to us through prophecy. And, I, and I'd like to give you this example of how powerful it can be. You know, my roommate in college uh, was Jewish, and I didn't want to be the ugly American Christian, you know, and chase him around with my Bible and say, oh, I'm going to get a convert here. You know, I just tried to be a witness to him and uh, let him bring up the subject. Well, I didn't have to wait very long because apparently talking to evangelical born-agains was kind of the forbidden fruit for him in his background. So he was always asking me questions about why I believe Jesus this and what about this. And, you know, and, and we talk. And, and, and one night, uh, you know, we were talking. And he goes, oh, you know, Jesus is okay for you Gentiles, but, but you know, we Jews, we got a different deal going on here. And I said, well, I just want to read you a, a passage of Scripture and see what you think. And he said, okay. And I said, uh, I, I read him this passage. Uh, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I read him that, and, and he said, ah, oh, well, you know, that's just your New Testament. And I said, wrong, that's your Bible. And I handed it to him, and I said, this is Isaiah chapter 53. This was written 700 years before Jesus came on the scene. You know, and it just blew his mind. You know, and, and when we begin to understand that this is an, an isolated incident that we find, oh, 103 Old Testament prophecies Jesus fulfilled. By the way, twice as many regarding his second coming, including a number that were seen fulfilled in our day and age with Israel coming back into the land, first reclaiming the land physically, then being restored to it even politically, and then finally and most wonderfully in passages uh, like uh, Ezekiel chapters 36 uh, through 37, we see the people of Israel being restored spiritually back to the Lord. Well, that's a miracle in and of itself. Uh, when the Jews were dispersed from the land after the Bar Kochva rebellion, roughly about 125 uh, A.D., uh, they were sent to the four ends of the earth. They weren't allowed to live in their historic homeland anymore. Uh, cultural anthropologists tell us there's a five-generation rule that if you take any people group and remove them from their uh, country of origin, uh, it takes five generations, but they'll be completely assimilated into the culture they go to. And, boy, I'm a, I'm a great example of that. Uh, my uh, ancestors, at least on my dad's side of the family, came over a little bit before World War I uh, from Northern Europe. I had the opportunity to be able to meet uh, some of my cousins from Sweden at a family reunion. And it was uh, pretty amazing because uh, the ones that were uh, junior high age and above spoke better English than we did. Uh, but junior high age and below... Uh, they didn't really speak very much English at all. It was so weird looking at someone that you were related to and trying to kind of pantomime, do you want to play catch with a ball? Uh, you know, how much Swedish do I know? <laughs> Basically zip. I, you know, I've been completely assimilated into American culture, but there's an exception to that rule. It's the Jewish people. And, and they didn't stick together. They didn't maintain their national identity because it was easy Wherever they went, they were horrifically persecuted for their identity as Jews. Just think how easy it would have been for a Jewish person in Nazi Germany just to go, Jewish? What do you mean Jewish? I, I don't know what you're talking about. But they, they stuck doggedly to their Jewish identity, even when it meant facing the Holocaust. So, you know, again, the fact that the Jews have existed and persisted for uh, all of this time, well over 1,700 years before uh, the uh, Zionist movement began to reclaim the land back in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, it's just nothing short of a miracle, and yet we're seeing this miracle fulfilled today. And I think we're seeing a lot of things uh, coming on the scene as far as setting the stage for last day's events, the particular nation states and the battle groups and things like that uh, in, our, in our time. And where do you get that? Uh, you know, the Bible isn't hit and miss. It's not like, uh, say, Gene Dixon, who uh, warned JFK not to go to Dallas, uh, you know, the famous astrologer and soothsayer. Uh, but uh, out of the same mouth, she predicted that we'd have World War III with China in 1962. That didn't happen. Uh, but the Bible doesn't make these kind of mistakes. Its track record and predictive prophecy is 100% accuracy. How could that happen? Well, it, to have biblical prophecy, you've got to have a couple things in place. Number one, you've got to have a source of information who is not bound by time to see future events. That source of information also has to be sovereign in control of all things to make sure that these events actually come to pass. So who fits that description? The God of the Bible. So that's why we believe the Bible is the word of God, and you should too. And notice what we mean by evidence as well. It's not something that gives us 100% certainty because no one can claim that. Just some fool can say, well, that's not good enough. We're going to give you enough reasons to come to a conclusion, and if that's not good enough, try me. But understand as well, if you are willing to come to a conclusion, we do encourage that. We have reasons to trust the Bible. That's why it's called faith. Not because we trust it blindly, but we have reasons to. Right. So It's not a leap into the dark. It's a step into the light. That's right. what biblical faith is all about. Exactly. All right. Got uh, two questions from Allie. Uh, wants to know, first and foremost, in the context of social media, 
How do you think Christians should behave in the culture of, well, I just like your content or subscribe? Is there uh, basically a requirement of deeper relationships than that? And how can we be salt and light if our agora these days is digital? Yeah, well, you know, again... Uh, we, agora, we, by the way, means where you socially interact. Yeah, <laughs> we live in, in very, very different times. You know, I used to think my grandfather... Uh, really uh, had an amazing view of human progress because he was born in 1900. He was around when the Wright brothers took their first uh, motorized flight. Uh, he was also around to be able to see the moon landing. And, uh, you know, with the advent of television and all of these other things that we've seen in, in, uh, in our day and age. But uh, the, the funny thing is when I tell people, uh, I was asked this question, what do you think? Uh, is the most significant technological development you've seen in your life. I'd say the most significant event, in my opinion, was the moon landing in 1969. But uh, I'd say the most significant development has been the advent of the Internet. Because it's changed not just how we communicate, but in a sense even the style in which we communicate. And, uh, you know, in, in a sense, Allie, I don't think the problem is with the Internet as much as the heart that people bring to the internet and i think we kind of shuffle back to genesis where you start to see that the thoughts and intents of man's heart are only evil continually you spend too much time dipping into uh, the uh, stream of the internet and you discover that you're kind of surfing on sewage uh, more often than not uh, you know in the running light organization has the statistics on this but the vast majority of traffic that happens on the internet every day is pornographic yeah and 60 percent of all internet items or objects or articles are sexually explicit in nature or yeah. at least suggestive in that yeah. direction and, and so was it the internet that did this no it was the heart that we brought to the internet that did it so as far as answering your questions of, uh, about how we as christians can have healthy relationships on the internet uh you know the first uh, thing i would say and this sean you can certainly comment on this is uh don't set yourself up for failure by just uh, letting anything and everything uh, onto your computer screen or onto your cell phone. Uh, are there some ways that we can make sure that we don't get out of bounds? Yeah, uh, when it comes to accountability software, if internet promiscuity is a struggle for you, then be wise about it. Don't uh, give provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. There are plenty of good resources, ones that I use myself to keep accountability with those in leadership, you included. But when we're talking about these issues too, it's not just for our own input, but also for the output. Why does the Bible and does the Bible emphasize that we need to not only take in what is good, but return and pour it out? Well, this is what Hebrews 10 was talking about in verse 20. Actually, let's start in verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting, building up one another, so much more as we see the day approaching. We have a reason to believe these things, and because we have those things in common, we call each other Christians. Now, understand as well, if we only take in our own little input, we isolate ourselves and let God speak to us alone on the mountaintop, there may be a time for that, but it's not the way we were designed. No man is an island, yep. and everyone has been given spiritual gifts. You have the opportunity to encourage me in ways I can't do for myself, and likewise I to you. If we cut that off, even with the ease of the internet, that should encourage it more often, not less. Now note, I know because the accessibility of the internet makes it a little overbearing. You don't want to get that text at 4 a.m. or always spend your time messaging people and all that stuff. But we shouldn't neglect the opportunity to build each other up, not only as Christians, but as human beings, because that's the way God designed us. Yeah. I think the internet can make that easier, but also note that with ease also comes... I guess not the word would be contempt, but definitely taking it for granted, and we don't take advantage of it as much as we should. Yeah, Allie, one of the things that uh, we see is, uh, you know, we do a Wednesday night service called our Oasis service, and it's funny, we get about twice as many people uh, who watch our Oasis service online as actually show up to be there for the, the service itself. 
And, you know, hey, I'm all over that. You know, Wednesdays, you know, it's it's a you know, kind of uh, Mike, 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 it's hump day kind of thing. Uh, but uh, and, and people are tired and they've got their schedules and so on. And I'm just glad that people are taking in God's word. That That's awesome. And if this is how you take in the word of God, I'm glad that you're doing that. But you might want to mix in in your daily, uh, your weekly fellowship uh, structure the opportunity to interact in face-to-face with other believers in Christ, whether that's a small group Bible study or whether you say, okay, I'm going to watch a midweek Bible study online, but I'm going to be there at church on Sunday so that I can interact. And I can not only be blessed, but be a blessing uh, to the saints. You got to have that balance that's there. You know, the other thing that I would say uh, about uh, the internet uh, is this. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 And verse 14 says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Uh, You know, if you're going to be involved with being online and, you know, having your Facebook deals and, and, uh, you know, visiting, you know, chat sites and, and so on, Uh, Make sure that your agenda gets set in prayer before you get there. Uh, In in other words, if you just sort of flop open your phone and you go online and you start getting involved in the conversation, uh, you know, you're going to find that the people that are sarcastic at best, maybe even aggressive, uh, maybe even mean and rude, are going to be the ones who are setting the spiritual temperature in these conversations. And if we don't come in prayed up with an agenda, it's just saying, okay, God, I want to shine for your glory. I want to do all things without complaining or disputing. Boy, if you do that on the internet, uh, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb. But if you go in and you have a purpose before you sign on, before you engage, before you start exchanging uh, on the internet, you're going to have a far greater chance of being used by God in a powerful way than if you just sort of ride with the tide and go with the flow, so to speak. And so with that said, uh, I also note if you're, you prefer internet interactions, you're more socially awkward like me, just remember that there is a time and a place for those sort of hands-off approaches. Take advantage of the opportunities we have in our culture to engage on more familiar terms. Right. But remember also that God designed us to look each other in the eye. There's a more genuine approach there. It may take some time to develop, but it's far better than just having your uh, uh, social needs, so to speak, given through a computer screen. Yeah, Ali has a a great question. We can wrap this up real quickly. It says, in the context of abortion, what does the uh, birth of Jesus tell us about uh, when life begins? Well, when we saw in Luke chapter 1, Ali, that there was a very interesting reaction, not only to Jesus' conception, but also in his prenatal state. As you know, abortion is being made more and more accessible at later and later terms. But when Jesus was in the end of the first trimester and John the Baptist was in his second, both of them had a spiritual experience where in Luke chapter 1, Elizabeth remarks that the babe, second trimester, leapt within her womb for joy because the mother of her Lord. Now note, Mary is considered a mother. Jesus is considered very much present within her womb, not having entered existence yet once she leaves the birth canal, or once he leaves the birth canal. It was all set on that foundation, and a spiritual reaction was given simply by him being there. If you call yourself a Christian, you can't call yourself pro-abortion. But if, on the other hand, you are influenced by this culture and aren't sure on the issues, let the Bible determine those standards because it is very clear. Hey, great uh, question, Allie. Thanks so much for being a part of the broadcast. Thank you all for being a part of the broadcast today. We hope God's Word has encouraged you and built you up. Scott Richards for Sean Richards. Wish you a great rest of your day in the Lord. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.